I'm Stan Stoniker, and I'm at the Hub Culture Davos Pavilion during the World Economic Forum 2013. And joining me is David Kirkpatrick, the founder of the Techonomy Conference, one of the world's leading technology and innovation summits that happens every year in Tucson with a number of regional events around the world. And also author of The Facebook Effect, one of the definitive books about Facebook. No, the definitive book. The definitive Thank you. book. Absolutely. So, David, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about... Um, your view of technology. I don't goes. want to start this interview sounding arrogant, but there's no other real book about Facebook, and that's a fact, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to start today's talk about uh, the shift and the change that's happened in technology over the last 10 years. This year, uh, 2013, is the 10th anniversary of Hub Culture, and we were thinking about how the world of technology has changed from 10 years ago to now. So I wonder if you could comment on how different you see the world of technology today yeah. from then and just what the, the four trends you see coming. That's a fun fun topic. I mean, when you mentioned this before we went uh, on camera, the first thing I thought of was that 2003 was the year before Facebook was invented. So 10 years ago, we did not have Facebook. Uh, 10 years ago, in 2003, uh, MySpace had maybe at peak 50 million users, or maybe at peak 10 million active users. Um, and uh, there were a few other things happening. LinkedIn existed already and had maybe 500,000 users. Um, so social networks had started to exist, but they were not a societal phenomenon. I mean, the existence of Facebook initially in 2004 as a student service and then starting in late 2006 as a everyone service, that's a pretty big shift in technologized landscape. Um, similarly, uh, the iPhone was launched uh, in uh, 2007. And so, you know, 2003 was four years before the iPhone. Think about it, you know. So we really didn't have what we now think of as smartphones. I think in 2003, I was probably using a uh, Palm Pilot. Uh, a, might have been a Palm phone. Or maybe a Nokia. And I never had a Nokia, but uh, I had a phone that maybe you would call today moderately smart because it had a calendar and um, a database on it and a little bit of writing stuff. But, uh, you know, this idea of an Internet-connected device, which we now couldn't live without, was unheard of. We didn't walk around connected to the Internet in 2003. There was none of that. Uh, nobody did it. Um, and, uh, in fact, a lot of people in the United States were still just shifting to cell phones. And one thing that was not common in the U.S. in 2003 was texting. Not at all. It was common in Europe, interestingly, but it had not come to the U.S. at all. So, you know, now texting is so universal and so much the way we all communicate. It's, it's interesting to recall that there was a pricing issue and how uh, the, the carriers charged for it and also um, just social norms. Um, you know, we didn't do it, uh, even though it was possible in 2003. A few people in the U.S. did it in 2003, but it was not the way most people communicated. Um, uh, I mean, it was, I guess it was taking off, but it was not a big deal. So uh, there's so many things that, that, are, that, are, that have transformed. I mean, Google was dominant, so there's something that uh, has remained pretty much constant. You've got to give them a lot of credit for staying relevant over the entire period, and in fact, extending their relevance with uh, Android and uh, Gmail and uh, YouTube, um, et cetera, et cetera, Google Docs, um, they really have knocked it out of the park. And another one that was then around and quite important was for, for those who were early adopters, more or less, is Amazon. Um, it wasn't super early adopter, but it was not used by nearly the percentage of society that it is today. Um, so I guess 2003 was kind of one of those nascent periods 10 years ago when things were starting to clarify. And you might say that right now in 2013, we're sort of at the end of that period of clarification. We are now a, in, in the developed world, a pretty fully mobile, internet connected, socially networked society. So the potentialities that were already evident in 2003 have now been realized. So what's next? Yeah, so I'm curious then, you go look back 10 years and where it was, if you look ahead 10 years, and of course it's always a fool's <clears> game <throat> to predict the future, but based on what you know and your long history, really at the forefront of tech, 
How is it different today? What's going the What's going to lead the tech revolution? Well, I think the main thing that's different now is just the pace of tech evolution is much more rapid. It just gets more rapid every year. So you know, we can sort of see that PCs are going away and tablets are coming in and, and other forms of mobile media, uh, mobile mobile devices. Um, I suspect that the range of choices that we're going to have in two years will be far greater than we would guess right now. Um, and uh, that also that will extend itself into the developing world much more rapidly. So one of the things that we're now seeing is that the whole world is starting to move in tandem. So that was, you know, what tech in 2003 was a developed world luxury, even still. It was really for rich people, and it was making rich people richer. But in that 10 years, you know, tech, and particularly mobile, has extended to every country on the planet, you know, so that Nigeria now has, I don't know, 70% cell phone penetration or something like that. Um, and, and so now we're getting to the point where anything that we start to do that's cool and new, they're going to do in Nigeria and Indonesia and, of course, China, but, you know, um, Thailand, Mongolia. Don't leave them out in your thinking. Whatever is going to happen next is going to happen globally. Um, I, I think another thing that's changed a lot is that China, in some ways, is ahead of the U.S. in its embrace of technology. There are now more Internet users there. Um, they have some ways more radical internet business models in some areas. Uh, they've got a more robust social media communications infrastructure with the Weibo's, and they have a more complex and sophisticated and in some ways promising interaction between the government and the citizens through social media as the government censors and observes the Weibo's and at the same time receives the information being spoken by the people in sort of like real-time feedback that goes to the government through their monitoring of the Weibo's in a way that Western governments just don't have. Um, and you know, do you think that that has the potential to be extended globally? So, I don't know. Maybe. You know, I'm not that's... sure. I'm not sure. Probably that's a little bit further off. I, I would like to think so, that that some kind of global, truly, you know, Facebook's trying to be a truly global social network, but it's locked out of China. Um, you know, China is sort of the outlier, it's the biggest country, and a lot of things don't exist there that exist here, and then they have a lot of things that we don't have. And, but we're seeing the breaking of that boundary with something like WeChat from Tencent that's now a global incredible. service and has grown to be, I, I'm told, if it's possibly true, 300 million users globally, in a very, I think in 18 months. So I have WeChat on my phone, although I don't use it very much. But um, you know, So now I'm using Chinese software products on my phone. That's a new thing. Uh, I would say in 10 years, probably we'll be seeing a lot more of that. The Chinese tech community will be much more deeply a part of how tech is evolving globally. Um, but I mean, if you really want to go further, further into what's going to, I mean, Google Glass is an indicator, I think, you know, new forms of interfaces. It's not just carrying around a piece of glass rectangle with a bunch of, you know, touch, touch screens are great, but that's still a sort of weird, primitive form of, well, compared to what we're going to have down the road, I don't know what it'll be, but it might be embedded in our glasses. It might be projective on the walls or maybe, you know, probably not implanted in our brains in 10 years, but 10 years is a long time. Anything's possible. Uh, you, you know, I think also you're going to see a lot of um, biological and biotech innovations that ch and also medical innovations and, and, and the interaction of medical innovation and IT so that this whole quantified self monitoring of our health kind of thing will almost certainly in 10 years lead to a much healthier society. Um, so a more prevention oriented society? I think, in general? I think it'll be more prevention oriented, but it'll be, you know, the real time feedback we're going to have about what's really happening with our bodies, uh, we will have to react to one way or other. Either we'll have to become fatalistic and say, yeah, I'm going to kick the bucket in, you know, 10 years. Or... I'm going to totally change the way I live and, you know, eat better and weigh less and stop smoking. I just heard somebody this morning talking about how smoking is potentially the biggest economic problem in China, uh, one of the biggest, because they're going to potentially have an epidemic of, of deaths related to lung cancer and other smoking-related things as they become wealthier, because wealthy people immediately, as they get wealthier, they start smoking and drinking more. And so, um, but that's, that's probably a, a blip because big picture, we're almost certainly going to head toward a healthier society because of tech. So I guess, you know, that's a thing you could say if you look at the last 10 years versus next 10 years. What's happened in the last 10 years is we've, we've put in place all this functionality 
that allows the generation of data uh, and the access of data for ordinary individuals and the accumulation of data for institutions and hopefully individuals will also have access to some of the aggregated data and we'll get to control our own data, we hope, although that's not true now. Um, but the platform that that creates is a platform for social transformation. Mm -hmm. And healthcare is one that we've just discussed. And it's one of the most expensive parts of the economy, so potentially a big boost to productivity. Yeah, well, education large. is another. Uh, you know, online education and, and digitized educational tools of various sorts, uh, probably not getting to, you know, the... Um, uh, what's that movie? Here? Do you think that education will be disrupted as severely as media has been? Yes. Like higher education? Yeah, I mean, it'll disrupt. It's, it's most, you know, most old media organizations do still exist. So, yeah, will, it, will, old, will the same educational institutions still exist? Yes. But right. will they be disrupted and forced to behave differently? Yes. Okay. Um, but I think it's going to go beyond that. It, it, what it means is it's going to enter into spheres we can't really uh, project now. Like we were just talking about sleep before. You know, I currently have in my pocket a Fitbit with which I measure my sleep. Um, in 10 years, that kind of thing could really have gone to a new place that we can't even maybe imagine now. Um, and I'm maybe trying to imagine it. Sleeping patterns? Maybe we'll sleep differently because we understand more about how to sleep and we can measure it and we can sleep in smaller chunks or more, you know, or longer chunks or... or or I don't know what. Optimized chunks. Or maybe we'll have a drug that means we don't have to sleep. You know, there's, people have talked about that sort of a thing. Um, but I think, so let's say we get to healthcare, education, I think governance is another one. You know, this thing I was saying before about the Weibo's in China. It's very tempting to ask the question, what happens to governance of all sorts, but actually literal government as well as the governance of social institutions uh, that are non-governmental? as this ubiquitous network society emerges where you really have the ability to essentially take the temperature of everybody in real time on anything. Uh, what that means... So instant is, polling, instant... I don't know what it's going to mean. Almost instant voting, perhaps? Yeah. yeah, maybe. Or maybe real-time, full-time voting. I mean, so we were talking the other day, what if we had real-time redistricting of U.S. congressional districts based on ongoing... Uh, 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 census. The census doesn't have to be a once every ten year activity. We could take a census in real time now with mobile devices, etc. And maybe then, then government would be totally different because we would we'd be constantly reconfiguring our congressional districts. It's not going to happen like that. But it, the questions of that type will be much more prominent, certainly by ten years and maybe sooner. Um, so you know, I think you're going to see government different. Uh, you're going to see nation-state relations different. You're going to see warfare different. You know, one of the big questions is whether cyber war really becomes a major factor in the human landscape in coming years and, and, and really becomes a, a significantly disruptive force or whether our defenses are good enough that we can forestall that. And probably I would argue for the latter. So, um, you know, you could just sit here prognosticating in the whole other range of other human arenas. Right. But I think... We're going to see human life changed on this tech platform of ubiquitously connected, internet-enabled humanity, uh, which was created in the last 10 years. Right. Amazing. So the first 10 years building, the next 10 years, I guess, evolving. I think so. I think we've been evolving, but I think the speed is going to accelerate. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. I'm Sam Stoliker at the Hub Culture Davos Pavilion with David Kirkpatrick, author of The Facebook Effect, the definitive guide on <laughs> Facebook, right? And the Techonomy Conference. The Techonomy Conference, the next one is coming up in... Well, we have a one-day U.S.-focused event in September 17th in Detroit, and then in mid-November in Tucson is our flagship globally-oriented event. All right, great. Well, we'll hopefully see you there. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Enjoy Sam. the rest of Davos. Thanks a lot. Okay, cheers.